Okay, so the world of enlightenment continues with Holstrom and its magical curve. Uh, Philippe Holstrom was the professor at Uppsala University in Sweden, and on his way to work uh, in the mornings, he would collect sediment samples from the river he walked next to, many looking at suspended load. From that, he developed this fantastic curve, which comes up a lot in geography exam. So what are we going to learn? We're going to look a quick look at how water flows, quick look at this curve, of course, um, then we'll look at the dark forces at work on water and then ask ourselves the fundamental question, is in fact Hullstrom's curve part of the grand unifying theory of the world, the universe? No, it's not. It's just really, really mark worthy. So here it is. This is Hullstrom's curve. Three different variations all have similarities. Notice we have a vertical axis of flow speed, usually in centimeters per second. It's common to all three and I won't dot around too much because I know how annoying that is. Just move myself over there and has a horizontal scale of grain size usually in millimeters centimeters per second velocity which of course half mv squared kinetic energy so your velocity is really in a, an allegory to uh, energy and then we have the grain size larger ones to the right smaller ones down here 0 0.011 up to 300 in this case or a thousand in this case uh, 0.011 millimeters, about the length of the hair of my head, a thousand millimeters, obviously you're getting up into bolder size. On this uh, graph, you've got two lines. Those lines are, first of all, the critical erosion velocity, and the critical erosion velocity, get this, it's two marks if you get a definition question, is the minimum velocity of water flow required to entrain a particle of a given size. The minimum velocity of water flow required to engage a particle of a given size. So if I, throughout this uh, video, use one millimeter, here's our kind of small sand grain. So a sand grain of a millimeter will require about, what, 30 centimeters per second to uh, be entrained. The other curve is known as the settling velocity, sometimes known as the depositional velocity, and that's the curve of the velocities required to maintain a particle in suspension. So the settling velocity, the minimum velocity required to keep a particle of a given size in suspension within the river. So for example, a 10 millimeter grain is going to require a velocity of about or almost 20, just around 20 centimeters per second to maintain in suspension. Notice, of course, the critical erosion velocity for any grain is larger than the settling velocity. That makes sense. What it shows is that it takes more energy to entrain a particle, more velocity, more energy to entrain a particle than it does to keep it in suspension. And that's where you get your three zones, best shown over here on the right, your erosion, your transportation, and your depositional velocities. All kinds of images, and here's an easier one. The purpose of showing this is another thing. This diagram uses logarithmic by logarithmic scales. And often in exam questions, when they ask you to talk about uh, the uses of logarithmic axes in geography, this is one that's completely overlooked because people are thinking about data presentation. So here, if we wanted to get in from one millimeters per second to 10,000 millimeters per second, that would be a very, very, very tall piece of paper indeed. Equally, if we wanted to go from hair diameter up to boulder diameter, it's going to be a very wide piece of paper. Hence, we use logarithmic scales. Remember with log scales, we just look back the previous slide, you get this ever decreasing actual gap on your graph paper between actual amounts. So one, two, three, four, etc. Just be careful how you use it, but use it powerfully in other work. Okay, what else do we need to know about this? So here's another version here with nice colors to aid those of you who need colors in your learning. Let's put myself a little bit up here. So, interesting fact, notice. The larger the particle size go beyond sand, the smaller the difference between the uh, critical erosion velocity and the settling velocity. In other words, the particle doesn't have to drop in, in terms of the velocity of water around it by very much for it to be deposited. Okay, interesting facts number two. Notice that as the particle gets smaller, the critical erosion velocity, the energy required to, over, to lift it up and entrain it, gets less until you get down to sands and then something bizarre happens because then for every decreasing size of sediment, you actually need a faster flow of water. What's going on? Very simple. 
It's easy to understand that the larger the particle, the greater the amount of energy required to pick it up when we go from sand up to cobble. Think about a big boulder, think about a big rock lying in a mountain stream. Clearly, the bigger the rock, the more energy required to just lift it up. That's absolutely intuitive. You've got to overcome gravity on the object. So what's going on down here? Well, here you've got two factors. And those two factors are, are very, very important. The first one is that very small particles such as clays have got very strong electrostatic charges. Clay is a micelle, that's a layer of minerals, it's got a very strong negative charge. So it's going to want to bond, much like when you do that thing where you rub the balloon and hold it against people's head and it goes, whoa, stands out. Yeah, I'm not very good at children's parties. This is what happens with the clay particle. It wants to bed to the rest of the bank, uh, to sorry, bind to the rest of the bank. Equally, because it's a very small particle, the water has to be able to flow around it and, and flow underneath it to be able to entrain it. And that means that you've got an entrainment problem. And I'm going to have a look at that um, with the aid of a, a little slide here in a moment. First things first, how does water flow? While I'm talking to you, have a look at the new scientist uh, animation that's above me here. So. The new scientist animation starts with corn flour and starch in here, and you can see three drops of ink. As they rotate the spindle, notice the ink appears to mix up. Notice that there's no, hor no vertical mixing, only horizontal. They then rotate slowly, corn flour and starch, very viscous, and hey presto, as if by magic, once they've wound it back the same number of times, we get the three dots of ink. No mixing, no turbulence. And this is an example of what's been shown over here, laminar flow. Laminar flow where the depth, all water at the same depth travels at the same velocity. And it doesn't take much to realize that that's not going to lead to much mixing. Well, the other three GIFs you can see expertly grabbed from the internet show that water doesn't flow like diagram A. It flows turbulently like diagram B. So you get ever different velocities or because of the objects you see here. An archy rock, you've got beds and banks, even on the surface it's showing. So we don't get this linear constant velocity af affecting the bottom of the river or things that have been suspended. And therefore, we don't get a simple entrainment velocity. It's the water finds itself in a very turbulent, mixed set of velocities. If we look at um, what happens with the entrainment process for a moment, this is the bed of a river. This is known as the armoured layer. And you can see here very large rocks and very small rocks. You can see the very small rocks are able to pack very, very tightly so that the water will be able to flow over them and won't be able to get underneath them very well. Let's take a single rock. Let's take this one here, which I will call Bob, because that's a funny name. The Bob here, as you can see lower down as well, is under pressure from water flowing over him, water cascading and flowing over him. That water exerts a force known as fluid drag. It has a horizontal component going down with gravity, and it also it creates, because of the same processes really uh, one can associate with uh, less fluid environments like the air, it, it also imparts a vertical force. Now all of the science is written for you on the right, you can, you can read it if you like, and all of that explains what's going on. But the process combined is known as fluid drag. Horizontal is easy to understand, the vertical is explained a little bit more down here. You don't need to know too much about it, but your textbooks don't typically have it in there because it's fluid dynamics, it's science, it's physics. Shh, many of your geography teachers don't understand it. Now, obviously, once a small particle, Bob, has been entrained, we no longer have that electrostatic bonding to the, to the other rock to worry about, and that's why it requires very little energy, i.e. velocity of flow, to keep him suspended. That's why fine particles are easily suspended, um, such as um, processes. Okay, coming near the end now, there are four types of load in a river. There's um, uh, dissolved load, otherwise known as solutional load, there's suspended load, there's saltation, and there's traction. Now, traction load is quite interesting because, of course, it never actually leaves the bed or bank. So that, that fluid drag horizontally pushes it along the river. We're not really interested in, in that, but we can understand it. That's why Hullstrom's curve has a little bit of grand unifying theory about it, but not too much. Suspension we understand, that's your transportation zone in here. Anything that's been entrained will be moved by suspension. And then saltation, the process is the process that's best to understand. Let's take a particle here with a one millimeter grain size. He's floating around quite happily. It might in fact be Bob himself. Um, if, however, in the eddying water, he suddenly finds himself in water that is of a lower velocity, 
he will, of course, if it goes below the critical erosion velocity, be deposited. If, however, the water then suddenly around him on the armoured layer increases in velocity, he may well be entrained again. And by being entrained, of course, he's also now being transported. Because if the velocity exceeds the settling velocity, a particle will remain in suspension. One big thing, though, a really good word coming out. If our particle sticks to another particle, and for example, it's going to have like deltas where the salts in the seawater, particularly uh, NaCl, sodium chloride, those are very strongly positively charged, which means Bob might stick to Bob, might stick to Bob, might stick to Bob, might stick to Bob, and Bob becomes a larger particle in a process known as flocculation. That larger particle, of course, might mean that Bob, if he gets larger, may find himself, not because the water velocity has changed, although, of course, it will have done as the river meets the sea, but actually because the particle size has increased. So flocculation to do with sea salts in the water may help particles come together bigger and therefore be deposited. Another mark-worthy area that you might be questioned on. Now, when Philipp uh, Hulström had finished his work, uh, he was actually taken over as a professor at Uppsala University uh, by Sundborg. And Sundborg, in 1956, thought, ah, I want to build in that consolidation of clays and, and, and minerals into Hulström's curve. And he came out with this beautiful diagram. The good news is I've never seen it in a textbook, and it's not on your specification. If you want to go and wiki it, you can. Personally, I'll just leave it there. Leave it to somebody else. There you have it. Grand unifying theory of everything you ever wanted to know about particles and Philippe Holstrom's magical curve. I thank you.